Greetings, Montana, and hello, world. It's Chris Hislop here from the Montana World Affairs Council. Welcome to another session on International Careers Week. This week, Monday through Thursday, 8.30 to 2 o'clock, we are bringing you a dizzying array of international experts to help answer one of the most common questions we get when we're out in schools with expert speakers. And that question is, how did you get the job that you do? And so we decided let's put together a group of amazing individuals who are engaged in international careers to help answer this question. We've had experts from here in Montana, from around the United States and around the world in an incredibly diverse array of jobs from the ambassadors, uh, we've had US State Department people, UN people, international lawyers, you name it, we're trying to cover it this week. And so let me just kick off by giving special thanks to our very generous donors at the Dennis and Phyllis Washington Foundation, Allegiance, First Interstate Bank, Trail West Bank, QFI, High Stakes Foundation, and the Longview Foundation. They help us bring this and so many more of these programs to you. So if you are the kind of person who's interested in an international career, this is definitely the place for you this week. So I am extremely pleased to invite three friends from the World Wildlife Foundation. First is Jessica Leung. Jessica is a program manager for WWF's Early Talent Diversity Programs. She manages their centralized diversity-focused internship program and leads engagement with targeted minority-serving colleges and universities, student organizations, and other academic strategic partners. She's joined by, with uh, Patrick Lendrum. Patrick is the senior science specialist for WWF's Northern Great Plains Program. He leads the development of science priorities for the program, implementing projects to answer key scientific questions that address the loss of native grasslands and the impacts that these losses may have on the wildlife and human communities that depend on them. Libby Kamalo serves as coordinator of BNGA, a conservation social scientist by training with skills in research design and qualitative analysis the Spokane County Washington native studied community-based conservation in Southern Africa and has taught a variety of conservation and recreation courses for the College of Forestry and Conservation here at the University of Montana. Welcome to all three of you and Jessica, very pleased that you and your colleagues could join us. I wonder if I could pass it over to you to have some discussion with your colleagues. You know, we're so interested in what WWF does and also kind of looking at careers or opportunities, not only in your organization, but in your field here in Montana and around the world. Over to you. All righty. Thank you so much. So, Hi, everybody, and welcome. I'm so pleased to have you join us today. So World Wildlife Fund is one of the world's, uh, one of the world's leading conservation organizations. Uh, you might've seen our logo, the Panda. We've worked for 60 years in nearly a hundred countries um, to help both people and nature thrive. We are supported by 1.3 million members in the United States and more than 5 million members worldwide. Our organization is dedicated to delivering science-based solutions to preserve the diversity and abundance of life on earth halt the degradation of the environment and combat the climate change crisis. Now, a lot of you based on our name might think we just work on wildlife, but that is not true. We certainly do work on wildlife issues, but we're also um, working on forest issues, fresh water, food, oceans, um, and climate change, as I mentioned. And we are a fairly big organization. My colleagues, uh, Libby and Patrick today and I are working in the United States, but we do work with network partners around the world. And in order to do that, we not only need scientists and researchers, but we also need people on the operational side. So for example, I sit on the diversity, equity and inclusion team, which is under our people and culture function, also known as human resources. But we also have teams that do our accounting, do our marketing communications, they help us fundraise, they're in um, federal and state policymakers offices, and they're also working with corporate sustainability partners too. And so when you think of World Wildlife Fund, while yes, you know, we are the panda, we work on wildlife issues, we do so much more. And there are definitely pathways um, in different careers um, that we're happy to share more about. 
But today, um, I wanted to introduce my two colleagues here, both in Montana, actually. So while we do have a global footprint, we wanted to feature some of our um, careers um, in your state today. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce uh, Libby first, and then we'll have Patrick go, and then we'll have a short conversation. And are very happy to open uh, to ask your to answer your questions um, and whatever else you're curious about in terms of our jobs. Um, so Libby, um, with that, let me hand it over to you to provide a short overview of what you do at WWF. Hi, everybody. Happy to speak with you today. Um, as has been mentioned, I coordinate BNGA. We like to call it BINGA for short, and that stands for Buffalo Nations Grasslands Alliance, which is this um, dynamic new native-led 501c3 organization. So it's a nonprofit that envis envisions Native nations uniting to ensure that the diversity of life in the Northern Great Plains flourishes for current and future generations. So I work primarily with folks from 16 Native nations that um, stretch from Montana into North Dakota and South Dakota. And Binga's mission is to ensure that all 16 Native nations have the technical and financial resources to plan and act on their visions for their traditional lands and waters. And so that includes ensuring that Tribal members thrive by sustainably stewarding and connecting with natural resources, that grasslands and native wildlife are restored or enhanced, and that fish and game departments have the capacity to deliver conservation impacts at scale. A lot of people may not know that um, each tribe has a fish and game department and so manages wildlife on their lands. And when you look at all 16 Native nations across the Northern Great Plains, there are about 10 million acres of tribal trust land that Native nations are stewarding. And so my job is to support this non-governmental organization um, as they are supporting tribes and in reaching their goals. So essentially, I'm a conservation manager, and I apply conservation social science theory, interpersonal skills, leadership and management skills, and a lot of perseverance to ensure that my partner's conservation visions become reality. Um, so I often bring structure and process to um, support them as they are working towards their visions and goals. Essentially, BINGA was established to build capacity and raise sustainable funding needed to accomplish huge goals over 10 years. For example, um, one of BINGA's goals is that 30% um, of tribal lands in the Northern Great Plains will be under native-led conservation management. Um, they want to create 60 new or expanded sustainable and natural resource-based enterprises. They want to support um, tribal members' understanding of connections between people and nature and strengthen those and support indigenous lifeways. So some of the things I do to promote these 10-year goals is I work a lot on building relationships with people and connecting people to resources, whether it's to each other oftentimes. So within Native nations, across Native nations, there's so much expertise and connecting people with, with those, that expertise is so important. Connecting people with funders and funding and technical experts, all draft strategic plans, I do a lot of writing and managing grants and budgets, facilitating meetings. Um, I do things like taking notes and I mentor interns. I coordinate workshops. I do a whole array of things. Um, so my typical day really varies. It's all kinds of variation, but a lot of it is tracking um, my team members' efforts as they work together and making sure those things stay coordinated. And a lot of times I'm meeting with people to listen, to provide guidance and coordinate action. What don't you do, Libby? <laughs> it is a full plate and more. Um, next up, we're going to hear from Patrick. Great. Thank you, Jessica. And thank you for all that are listening and happy to be here and honored to be talking to you all. Um, that's a tough act to follow. <laughs> Libby does an incredible job and a lot of work. We're fortunate to have her at World Wildlife Fund. Uh, my job here is, I guess I'd say, a conservation biologist. Uh, we work to conserve the last one of the last few remaining intact grasslands. So grasslands are the least protected, most at-risk biome on the planet. And one of those strongholds is really right here in Montana. So that's why our office is based here. Uh, getting to this stage, I'd say, has not been a straight path. Many of you here might be wondering what you're going to do, what options there are for careers, why do them. 
Uh, I'd say for me, the one common theme that I've had throughout all of my careers is a passion for the outdoors and a passion for supporting people. And that led me to World Wildlife Fund. Um, it's been a, like I said, sort of a, a circular path, right? I've worked with plants, I've worked with insects, with grizzly bears, with mountain lions, with trees, with buffalo, with black-footed ferret, um, but all of those really come together in the grasslands in this ecosystem. And so I've worked where I've been in the field a lot, I've worked behind a desk a lot, um, at the computer, and so there really is not a, a day in the life of a conservation biologist. It really depends on what you're doing, what path you've taken, where you are in that career. Um, but each step of it is exciting. And you find that passion at each of those steps. So right now in our work, we work with communities on the ground that are out there counting animals every day. Excuse me, they might be tracking insects, catching insects and looking at how grassland restoration is benefiting pollinators. Uh, it might be native nations that are tracking black-footed ferrets, spending hours at night with spotlights, trying to find little green eye shine in the middle of the night. Um, it might be helping to move buffalo from one location to another so that their herds can grow. And as the science team with World Wildlife Fund, we try to support all of those efforts. So if I try to describe what I do currently, I'd say I work in part with climate change mitigation, in part with sustainable food production, in part wildlife biology, and really the most important piece of all conservation is working with those communities on the ground and making sure they're a piece of that puzzle. Very beautifully said, Patrick, thank you. So now I thought we'd do a little bit of a quick fire back and forth um, to ask both Libby and Patrick um, a little bit more about um, their careers and their pathways. Um, so the first question I have, um, and Patrick, we're gonna have you go first is, why do you think your profession matters? And for our audience in particular, in the early stages of their careers, um, you know, what might be important for them to know about your profession? Yeah, great question. Um, and I have two hours to answer that, right? Is that uh, yeah, uh, we're gonna so... boot you off the call with, with you can go over 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fair enough. Yeah, um, yes, that's very interesting. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, move right along. <laughs> Uh, so I think to sum it up, life on this planet as we know it depends on conserving and restoring biodiversity. Um, biodiversity is intricately linked to our food production systems. It's linked to human health and well-being. It's linked to climate change. And all of those are in turn circular linked to each other. And so as wildlife conservation biologists that we all do and support, um, it, it really isn't just one piece of that, it's all of it, right? And so the WWF Living Planet Report recently identified that there's been a 70% decline in species populations just since 1970 across the globe. 70% decline since 1970, and that should alarm all of us. Right? That should be enough to make us say, we need to do something and make a difference. And so I think that's why this work is so important. We are helping to conserve nature and we are helping to uh, promote equitable and just livelihoods for people as well. Um, we work in Montana, but we work across the US as Jessica so well put it, we work across the globe trying to do this everywhere. And that's really, I think the passion and the importance of part of what we do. Yeah, certainly. I think one thing I can say um, for many employees is even though we might be in Washington DC like myself or Montana or in different countries, we all have a common mission, um, and that is to help people in nature thrive. And it can sometimes be a little bit daunting, those numbers. And, um, you know, what keeps us going, I think, is knowing that we're all working together at different parts of the system in order to try to drive, um, you know, these broader goals. Um, so Libby, what about you? Why does this profession matter to you? Well, I'll, um, I, I want to quickly say that, um, my international work, so my studies for my master's and my uh, dissertation work were in Southern Africa. And so that's actually informed my work in the United States and it regularly informs that I learned a lot from that context. So I think domestic work and international work ideally inform each other. Um, and why does this profession matter? I think I, I see it that 
a lot of people, perhaps most people are filled with really good intentions and want to see, you know, a bright thriving future and make a difference, but often people don't know how to reach their goals. And I firmly believe in the statement that if you want to go fast, go by yourself. If you want to go far, go together. And so I focus on going together. Um, so I, as a conservation manager, our, our work really matters because we're building coalitions towards collective action, which is going to make the biggest change, the longest lasting change. Um, and so to do that requires coalition building, project management, and social science to, to come together to make large scale change happen in a rapidly changing world. Um, so I, I think in a sense, that's the, the core piece I wanted to bring out. Well said, thank you. Um, back to you, Patrick. So you mentioned you're working sometimes with bears, with insects, with people behind the desk, outside. Um, so lots of variety. Um, and when you think about the different places that you go, the different environments um, you're in, what are some upsides and downsides? Um, and they could be very practical or they could be maybe more broad too um, about the conservation work at large. Yeah, another great question. Um, there's lots of upsides to the work. There are downsides as well, of course. I'd say some of the biggest upsides are knowing that we're working towards something that we're all passionate about and we see as meaningful. That provides that daily drive. You need to enjoy what you do. And I'd say we definitely do that. Um, upsides are also when you see those wins, right? You see numbers of species increasing instead of decreasing. All right, that has a lasting impact. That's really beneficial. Uh, some of the downsides I'd say in conservation in general um, is that it's a very reactive field. We've identified a problem and we're trying to fix that problem. So you already know what you're up against and then how do you sort of change that trajectory? That can be tough at times. Um, you really see that glass half full and trying to make it a half, you see it half empty and you try to make it half full type of a perspective. Right? Um, other ups are, again, the people piece of it. We work with incredible people in conservation. Um, it can also be difficult at times working with a lot of people with a lot of different entities. It means a lot of meetings, a lot of discussions. You have different viewpoints and that's part of it is important, working towards common ground. Um, so I'd say the ups and downs complement each other throughout the work. Nice. And for you, Libby, when does your work feel like, you know, you're in flow, you're lifted, and when is it, okay, <laughs> time to take a breather? <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll start out with the downsides. Um, so I think I call it staring into the abyss on a regular basis, which is, you know, looking at declines in species, extinctions, and, uh, you know, working with native communities looking at present day impacts of settler colonialism and genocide in our country on native communities and as well as present day systemic racism because we're working to address that on a daily basis and this sort of you know idealism and approach can can really raise a risk of burnout if one doesn't take care of oneself so that's really important to take care of yourself and your your colleagues and your community um, and sometimes I find that people in my daily life outside of work um, don't often relate to what I see and experience because it's a, a very niche role working cross-culturally and across communities. Um, but I love my job because I think it's exhilarating to feel like I'm at the cutting edge of change and innovation. Um, this requires entrepreneurialism and risk-taking and creating a first-of-its-kind organization in the region. So it's really exciting to be part of a team who is doing that and creating that change. And it also is challenging, and I love challenge. It requires a huge breadth of skills and courage to take calculated risks with this committed team. Um, but it's so fun to see the rewards and see you know, more and more great things happening and the growth of this organization and, and the change it's creating. Yeah, I love that you mentioned courage, one of our core values at WWF, in addition to integrity, respect, and collaboration. Um, I want to pass it back to our host and see if there's any questions from outside um, right. or any other 
thoughts? In fact, mm -hmm. there are. In fact, there are. I mean, first, Jessica, a question to you. Um, uh, would you possibly be looking for a side gig as a webcast moderator? Because here at the World Affairs Council, we'd be very happy to take you on. <laughs> Extremely well done. And, and thank you. Um, um, to to you both for your responses. Great questions. It really gives us some idea of the organization and your roles in it. Now, I'm very happy um, to once again have the students from Bozeman High School join us. I don't know quite how to describe them other than, uh, you know, high order um, academic and intellectual um students who just love to know more about what's going on, they tend to ask a lot of questions. Uh, and I've been telling guests when we get these questions, it's a bit of a speed dating thing. You know, I got a lot of questions from Bozeman High. So what I'll do is I'll push one out there for you and ask you to kind of give a, an abbreviated response because already we have four with maybe about 10 minutes to go in our webcast. So let's, with no further ado, and thanks to Bozeman High, number one, how does your work influence environmental policy? Uh, let me start off and then I'll invite Patrick and Libby to chime in. Um, so as I mentioned, we have a major policy and um, we have a policy and government affairs team here at WWF. We have colleagues that are working on federal policy here in Washington, DC, as well as on the state and local level. Um, our policy team liaises directly with teams like um, Libby and Patrick. So they will help um, say the freshwater and food team specifically advocate for issues on the Hill, on the Hill as in on Capitol Hill in uh, DC, um, or they might be uh, more cognizant of Northern Great Plains issues um, and the issues that are important to be elevated on a federal level or elsewhere. Uh, let me turn it over to Patrick or Libby to see if they wanna chime in on that. I'm happy to jump in. Um... I'll give three examples. So Buffalo Nation's Grasslands Alliance, along with the broader World Wildlife Fund team, has been advocating for the passage of Recovering America's Wildlife Act, which is game changing legislation, both for states, but especially for tribes, because it was set aside annual funding at an increased rate for them to further their efforts protecting wildlife. Um, we've also been part of helping to introduce North America's Grasslands Conservation Act, which would be also instrumental in protecting disappearing grasslands in the United States. And today, actually, WWF released its recommendations for the next Farm Bill. The Farm Bill is a hugely influential, influential policy in the country um, and impacts Native nations in a huge way, as well as our environment. Um, so encourage everybody to look into those. Cool, should we go to the next question? Sure, why not? Here's a quickie, everybody has to answer. Um, what is your favorite animal? Ooh. I'm not gonna go first on this one. <laughs> I need my time. <laughs> um, I'll go ahead and say for me, it's the grizzly bear. Uh, that's a real Montana answer. Thank you, Patrick. <laughs> I love anything marine. Um, I recently got to go to Puerto Rico and Hawaii in the last year or so snorkeling. And I've always loved marine animals, but just seeing some of the wildlife, all kinds of fish and starfish and sea urchins, um, it's it's a different world. And um, yeah, I have a love for marine animals in particular. Libby? Today I'll say the sandhill crane. I love hearing them when they fly overhead here in Bozeman. They're incredible, the sounds they make and just watching them fly. Oh yeah, that is so cool, yeah, agreed. Okay, here's the next one. I'm going to uh, pitch this one to you, Patrick, because the one after that goes to uh, Libby on Binga. So Patrick, um, what about WWF and ecology appealed to you versus tackling human issues? And how are wildlife and human issues connected? See these Bozeman students, they're serious. Yeah, that's no joke. Great question. Um, for me, I was drawn to the wildlife side of things because that's been my background. That's my education and understanding. And there are people out there that are better equipped to help support people than myself. That being said, like I mentioned, I don't see a clear disconnect. I think helping nature is helping people. So through that, I do work to support people. We work a lot with communities on the ground, but my training, my educational training is in wildlife biology. 
So that's the path that I took. I see. Okay. Um, Libby, this one comes to you. How does Binga interact with Yellowstone and the American Prairie Reserve? That's a great question. Right now, I'd say we don't at all, actually. Um, and that's something that Binga's board, um, as they're hiring a CEO right now, their first one ever, because they, they formed a year and a half ago, officially. Um, so they're still a new organization. They may decide to interact with them at some point, but they get their guidance from a, a set of advisors from Native nations, again, all from all 16 across the Northern Great Plains. But at this time, that that is not a focus of their work. Can I ask a quick follow up question, um, Libby? Can you describe um, how does Binga decide who to interact with and engage? Is it place based, people based? Uh, is it, a, is it a decision from the board, et cetera? So just broadening that question a little bit. Yeah, I would say Binga is always open to people reaching out and um, having conversations. Right now, the biggest focus is working with tribal councils, so leadership of you know formal government councils um, of the sovereign nations in the Northern Great Plains, as well as directors of tribal programs, whether it's their environmental offices, their fish and game offices, with leaders in tribal colleges, um, as well as leaders of native-led non-governmental organizations. So some examples that come to mind, in addition to tribal colleges, are um, Sichangu Co. and Rosebud Reservation, um, which reintroduced hundreds of buffalo recently um, to Rosebud. Um, and there's a whole bunch of other examples of native-led organizations, but that's really the focus right now is native organizations, tribal programs, but looking to expand partnerships where it makes the most sense. Libby, could I follow up on that one? That's a really interesting point because I'd like to relate it to a previous guest. Um, Rania uh, Dagash uh, Kamada, who is with the United Nations and has done a lot of work on humanitarian affairs, was telling us this morning about um, the international aid community and how around the world where when there's a humanitarian crisis, the response is typically led by nationals of that country, by people of that place. Now, sometimes we have this idea that it is an, a group of international so-called experts who parachute in and do all this stuff. But, you know, uh, according to Rania, the, of the over 400,000 international aid workers who are working today, well over 95% of those people are national officers or national uh, workers. And I, I, I wanted to see if there was a, um, a connection or a, a compliment when you talk about Binga and it being native led versus what sometimes might be this conception of a so-called external expertise doing the work or what have you. Can you expand a little bit on that idea? Yes, so I think Binga shares that philosophy exactly. So I am in a unique position. I am non-native and my role has always been designed to transition. So I'm not applying to be the CEO because I think the hope is to hire, you know, a citizen of, of a native nation. Um, Binga's board is six of the board out of the eight board members are all citizens of native nations. Um, what people would often say are tribal members. We prefer the, the first term though. Um, and so that's why we do focus so much on strengthening and supporting people within Native nations who are already the leaders in their organizations. And one of the core challenges they have faced is having sustainable financing. So they might get grants that last one to two years from the federal government, and then the grant's gone, and people who've gained skills and started projects have to leave. And so it's been a constant turnover and loss because of this lack of sustainable funding that has been typically from the federal government. And so we're working to create a conservation trust fund that would provide a set amount every single year to each of the 16 Native nations and bring in more money so that that money can be counted on every year and these programs can continue to sustain and grow and staff can be retained. And one uh, little tidbit of information I want to throw in is that there is it's documented that per capita, the federal government funds states at a much higher rate than they do tribes, even though the federal government has a trust responsibility to fund native nations based on treaties at a, a fair rate. 
And then, and so we are trying to address that gap both by engaging the federal government, but also getting private dollars from foundations to do that. Thanks a lot for that, Libby. Um, I'm going to ask, uh, I think we're going to have to wrap up on this question, but it's um, one of the more common questions, and I might say one of the more important questions for those who are watching today. And that is to get your views on what kinds of skills or characteristics or a, a profile and including a kind of an academic background would WWF and others who do similar work, what are you looking for so our students can better understand, maybe if I want to get involved in this, I should be thinking about developing this academic skill or this interpersonal uh, skill or get this kind of experience. So could you share with us some of your thoughts on that? Yeah, I can quickly kick it off. Um, let me allude back to the four values of our organization, courage, respect, integrity, and collaboration. We certainly ask people of any level, whether you're an intern or a full-time employee, a potential employee, how you've demonstrated those values in the past. So for example, when you've made a mistake, have you been able to own up to it and take responsibility? Um, do you speak up? And sometimes maybe you're the voice of dissent um, you know, amongst the group. How do you demonstrate respect and support to your colleagues? Um, because we are very highly collaborative, no matter the regions that we're operating in, no matter the work we're doing. And so we definitely ask individuals to demonstrate um, and model those behaviors throughout their time here at WWF. And the best way for individuals at any level um, to show that is to think about, you know, where have you been? And it's okay sometimes if it's been at school projects, you know, volunteering, et cetera. It doesn't necessarily have to be paid opportunities. We want to hear about when you've, you know, made mistakes or regretted a decision. Um, but how did you bounce back? How did you lift yourself or perhaps others up? Um, because we think those are the ways that um, you can contribute, um, you know, your values and contributions to the organization. Um, and so we definitely look for people to align with our values um, because we are a very values driven organization. So um, that's that piece, a little more abstract. And then I'll let Libby and Patrick chime in on any of the other, say, educational or other kind of pieces. Uh, I mean, I think that was beautifully said. <laughs> um, that captures a lot of it. Uh, the other piece is both those educational, live, and then work experiences. So building experience, starting off um, internships if you can, paid internships, summer jobs, uh, volunteer opportunities after school, just making sure you're engaged and involved and can speak to those um, experiences that you've had. And for every individual, that's going to be different. Right, you have to shape that to what you're looking to get into. World Wildlife Fund is huge. As Jessica explained, we work across the spectrum of different professions. So follow your passion, get experience, make connections. Um, that would be my parting words, I suppose. Yeah, I think it's important, again, thinking from my line of work, because WWF is a very diverse organization, but um, that you'd be able to practice a lot of humility, um, that you are skilled at writing and speaking and communicating, that you're really good at listening and listening first and then speaking, and that you're willing to keep questioning your own assumptions about the world, which is way easier said than done, because to do that, you have to handle a lot of discomfort. You have to, I have had to handle a lot of uh, listening and people challenging what I've said or done. And I also need to lean into healthy conflict, um, which Jessica has already mentioned as well, um, because that's how, how, that's how organizations grow and people grow. And, and so learning to have the ability to create a space for people to safely express themselves is a key skill set. And a way to develop those that you might not have thought about is read a lot about a lot of different things, not just the news, but like fiction, read a lot of fiction because there are studies that show it helps develop empathy, which is super important for a job like this. And seek out people with different backgrounds and perspectives. Seek to have your assumptions challenged on a regular basis, um, which can mean finding a way to take care of yourself to really deal with that discomfort that comes up when you're asking to have your viewpoints challenged. And then learn to respectfully disagree and embrace conflict. I think those are all really important skill sets in today's world. 
Well, that is pure gold from the three of you. Thank you so much. And, and it's a great way to end it up in giving our student participants some great advice on things that you can think about now to prepare yourself if you're interested in this kind of work or other international careers. Surely what you've just described is transferable in any number of other careers. So let me thank um, Patrick, um, uh, Libby, and Jessica once again from WWF for joining us. I'll quickly thank our, uh, you know, we've got a very generous group of sponsors at the Dennis and Phyllis Washington Foundation, Allegiance, First Interstate Bank, Trail West Bank, QFI, High Stakes Foundation, and the Longview Foundation. Now, uh, this wraps up day two. We're halfway through International Careers Week, but wait, there's more. Tomorrow, if you're interested in working with Doctors Without Borders, you should check in at 8.30. Following that, we have somebody from the CIA if you're interested in international intelligence and security. World trade follows that if you're interested in a, um, in a career that it follows a kind of global trade, it's going to be a great show. Then somebody from the private sector, a, a business person who does advertising, a global advertising, you know, there's uh, incredible opportunities there. And finally, former U.S. Ambassador Ted Osius is going to be talking to us about ASEAN, um, the regional organization in the Asia Pacific. Wow, big day tomorrow, another big day to follow. One last huge thank you to our friends from WWF. Thanks a lot for coming. We wish you all well. Thank you for participating. See you all tomorrow. Bye-bye.